Pulse. Gentlemen, how are you? We are great. Or I am great. I don't know about Stephen. I won't speak. <laughs> I'm doing great now. All right. Uh, Joe, do you want to harangue them before we turn the show over to them? Um, no, I think I'll save the haranguing for later. Okay. Um, first of all, Jeff Strand has awesome hair, as always. Thank Stephen you. Kosniewski has a beard that rivals, uh, you know, most Vikings, and I'm I'm jealous because I can't grow one. Um, <laughs> this is a homemade but, um, from Lynn Hansen. So yes, as as long as long as they don't have pants I, like uh, like uh, that other author that we don't talk about with, you know, his fabulous. You mean John Jans? I wasn't going to say his name because if you say his name too many times, he pops up. Um, it's like Beetlejuice. <laughs> but I will turn it over to you guys. Um, thank you from the bottom of my heart right, for Brian. everything everybody's done. Brian King, we'll, thank you. Thank you. Um, we will see you back on the stream later on this evening. And I'll be here. All, All right, right, guys. Love you. Love you, too. All right, gentlemen. I'm going to pop off, too. I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, the crowd is yours. All right. Would you like me to begin, Stephen? Yeah, go for it. All right. We will be alternating, going back and forth, telling very short tales of terror. And my first tale will be called Home with the Future. This house is perfect, said Elaine. It has plenty of space. The layout is exactly what we were looking for. There are good schools in the area, and the price is within our budget. I love it too, said David. I mean, look at that backyard. We can build a tree house for the kids. The kitchen has counter space galore. It's our dream home. How are we getting such a good deal on this place? I'm glad you like it, said the realtor. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I do have to tell you that this home is the site of several future murders. Elaine looked over at him. I'm sorry, did you say several future murders? The realtor nodded. A local psychic had visions. So much blood, so many body parts. But really, that's my only disclaimer. That's a pretty big disclaimer. Well, yes, the realtor admitted. But I should note that psychics aren't always reliable, and the visions didn't have any specific time frame for the massacre. Were you thinking of this as a starter home, or were you planning to stay a while? Well, we weren't planning to move out anytime soon, said Elaine. The kids are young. I mean, we never know what the future might hold in terms of our jobs, but the plan was to stay here until they both graduated high school. Hmm, said the realtor. Well, you know, for all we know, the murders could happen a century from now, though I'll admit the psychic didn't say anything about improved technology. This sucks, said David. The basement was going to be my man cave. I already knew where I was going to put the couch and the TV. There was a perfect spot for a bar. We could also turn it into a play area for the children, said Elaine. They have their own bedrooms, said David. That's part of the appeal of this place. They don't need their own bedrooms and a basement to play in. Can we discuss this later? Yeah, all right. But I thought we had an understanding. It sounds like you'll be able to work this out, said the realtor. So are we ready to sign some paperwork? Hold on, said Elaine. We still have the matter of the psychic visions. Do you have any other details? The realtor shook her head. Sorry. Any at all? Not that I can remember. No details about the victims. Um, It, it may have been a family. What sort of family, asked David. You know, a regular family, nothing special about them. I mean, every family is special in their own way, but it wasn't remarkable enough that I'd remember the details. Did this family have children? It's possible that they may have had two children, I suppose. We have two children, said Elaine. Were they sons or daughters, asked David. What do you have? A son and a daughter. Ah. What do you mean by that? Okay, fine. The visions involved a son and a daughter, but that's the makeup of plenty of families. It's the standard family dynamic. One father, one mother, one daughter, one son. If seven daughters were slaughtered in the vision and you had seven daughters, I think, oh, crap, better not buy this house. But your family is, and I, I mean no offense by this, generic. No offense taken, said Elaine. I guess I'm remembering the details better now. The psychic had a vision of a father murdering his family. Now, David, does that sound like something you'd do? I'd like to think not, said David. See, it would be completely out of character. Elaine, if you think your husband is capable of axe murdering you and your two children, then you have much greater problems to worry about than whether the basement is a man cave or a play area. Do you even own an axe? I own many axes, said David. 
Elaine nodded. He owns the largest axe collection in the Tri-County area. Noted, said the realtor. Do you mind telling me your children's hair colors? Why, asked David. No reason. Well, they both have brown hair. I see. And Elaine, the blonde hair you have right now, that's just a very brief phase, right? If I saw you shortly after you moved in, you'd be a brunette or a redhead, right? No, this is my natural color. Got it. And that dress you're wearing right now with a distinctive floral pattern, is it safe to assume that you borrowed it and won't be wearing it again? It's my favorite dress. Well, fudge. All right, time for some straight talk. There's a chance that the psychic's horrific visions were of you, David, hacking up Elaine and your two children with one of his many axes. I would have kept that information under my hat, but I strive to be honest in all of my dealings with customers. It's how I've stayed in business all these weeks. We appreciate your candor, said Elaine. Now, I could call the owners, but I really don't think I can get them to go any lower on the price. Question for you, said David. If a licensed psychic sees the future, can it be averted? Like, is it possible that's already too late? We love this home, and it would be a shame to go through all the trouble of trying to find a different one only to have me murder my family there instead. It's a very good point, said the realtor. The machinery of fate may already have set its gears into motion. You know, unless it's the house itself giving me instructions to kill, I think the massacre could happen pretty much anywhere. If I'm going to go psycho, I'd just as soon have it happen in a house where we got a good deal. I agree, said Elaine. It's such a lovely place. It'll be ashamed to drench it with blood, but think how much we'll enjoy before that dark night arrives. The realtor smiled. Sounds like you two have made a decision. Welcome to your new home. And the next two years, five months, 11 days, and four and a half hours were wonderful. That was Home with the Future. I now turn you over to the lovely and talented Stephen Kozanewski. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so... <clears throat> This is called an average day in the life of an indie horror author. So people often ask me what it's really like to be an indie horror writer, warts and all. So sit down, strap in and pull on your galoshes because I'm gonna walk you through what any given day is like down here in these trenches. <clears throat> Six o'clock AM. Wake up to ding of email offering nine cents per word to appear in anthology alongside King, Koontz, and Barker. 6.01 a.m. Remember you don't get out of bed for less than 10 cents per word and go back to sleep. 7 o'clock a.m. Kick supermodels out of bed. 7.05 a.m. Ring for manservant Spencer. 7.08 a.m. Berate Spencer for being slow to arrive. Subsequently, order him to clean sweaty money pile off of bed. 7.15 a.m. Go for quick dip in Scrooge McDuck style golden coin pool. 8 o'clock a.m. Select ascot and pocket square to match tweed suit jacket with leather patches on elbows. 8.05 a.m. Have Spencer sponge bathe and then dress you. 8.30 a.m. Mrs. Beauchamp Phipps rings bell to indicate full English breakfast served. Children rush past breakfast table, taking only Pop-Tarts and yelling over shoulders, sorry, I'm running late, even though there is an entire meal here, which we either do every morning or you would have told me specifically to be present for, so I should have planned my time accordingly, but since I didn't, I'm just taking a Pop-Tart on my way to school instead. Each child recites entire speech verbatim. Nine o'clock a.m. Consider writing. 2.15 p.m. Put down Xbox controller after finally earning Blessing of the Horned Rat trophy in Mordheim, City of the Damned. 2.30 p.m. Consider writing. 3 o'clock p.m. Castigate Spencer about not serving lunch baby bird style during recent Mordheim marathon. Angrily state, I do not wish to use my own teeth for mastication. 3.01 p.m. After using word mastication, remember about word masturbation. 3.03 p.m. Dismiss Spencer and vigorously self-flagellate to own 8.5 by 11 glossy author photo on back of latest hardcover release. 3.10 p.m. Have Spencer baby bird much overdue lunch into mouth. 3.30 p.m. Consider writing. 
4 o'clock p.m. Angrily realize that you have missed entire afternoon block of Craig of the Creek on Cartoon Network. 4.05 p.m. Utilizing TV Guide website, On Demand, and Pirate Bay for new episode, attempt to recreate recently missed viewing experience. 4.37 p.m. Cartoon viewing interrupted by phone call. 4.38 p.m. Listen to a casual acquaintance explicate lengthy, commercially unviable, cozy mystery idea. Variously attempt to explain that cozies are not within your comfort zone. Authors do not share money with idea comer up withers. And idea is terrible. 4.45 p.m. Finally agree to ghostwrite acquaintances idea for exorbitant fee, which will never be paid simply to get them off phone. 5.15 p.m. Become angered again as resumed cartoon viewing is interrupted by children returning home from afternoon activities to discuss bet they have made to turn bespectacled ugly duckling at their school into prom queen. 5.20 p.m. Angrily slam conservatory door on children and yell, Can't you see I'm trying to write? Do you think Fortnites in the Maldives just grow on trees? Because they don't, you little shits! 5.25 p.m. Check Twitter. 6 o'clock p.m. Bored with Twitter, Google own name. 6.10 p.m. In order to deflect shame of Googling self, send tweet asserting that real writers don't read their own reviews. 7 o'clock p.m. Mrs. Beauchamp Phipps presents a lovely coq au vin for dinner. 8 o'clock p.m. Sex in the City Marathon. 11 o'clock a.m. Consider writing. 3.30 a.m. Realize that it is almost, but not quite, too late to start getting drunk before morning, unless you start right now. Begin pounding shots of triple sec and or Baileys. 4 o'clock a.m. Angrily yell at TV about various more successful writers. 4.05 a.m. In order to deflect from shame of jealousy, retweet Jeff Strand's pinned post. 5.30 a.m. Demon sperm sex dream. 6 o'clock a.m. Wake up to ding of email, offering nine cents per word to appear in anthology alongside King, Kuntz, and Barker. Well, that was a delight, Stephen. Thank you. And completely accurate. That was basically my day. I, I know, right? That it. was yesterday and it was Groundhog Day. Yes, yes that was me peeking in the windows. All right. My next tale of terror is called The Soupville Stabber Practices Social Distancing. We're supposed to stay six feet away from everybody unless they live in the same household, said Wilbur. If you want to be safe, I think you need to follow that rule with your next killing spree. Are you kidding me? asked his brother Hank. I'm the Soupville Stabber. I stab my victims about a dozen times in the chest. That's my thing. That's what I'm known for. I get that. All I'm saying is that it's dangerous out there. I don't want you bringing a virus home. But I wear a mask. Your scary clown mask has mouth holes and nose holes. Yeah, okay, I guess it does. But if I wore a surgical mask underneath it, I don't think I could breathe. If I get dizzy from the lack of oxygen while I'm stabbing somebody, they could use that to their advantage and escape. You definitely shouldn't double mask it, said Wilbur. I'm saying that if you really need to satisfy your bloodlust before we flatten the curve, you're just going to have to suck it up and go for distance weapons. Hank shook his head. It's off brand. Then stay home. You know what happens if my need to kill isn't sated. You still have the missing arm. I know that. I'm, I'm reminded of it every single time I try to type. But you have to be responsible. Your victims scream a lot, right? Yeah. Well, during this pandemic, you can't be next to people who are screaming. They'd be sending microscopic particles towards your face at a high velocity. Maybe you could use, I don't know, a sword or something. You don't like six foot long swords. You could duct tape two or three of them together. Do you know how awkward that would be, asked Hank? And how the hell do I sneak up on somebody when I've got three swords taped together? Being the soup fill stabber is about stealth. Nobody's going to hang around in a dark alley if some guy in a scary clown mask is dragging a six-foot sword. Forget about the swords, then. Could you throw the knives? Say, what? Throw them from six feet away. 
What am I, a circus act? Throwing knives with that level of accuracy requires hundreds of hours of practice. I've used the same knife to claim all my prey. It was dad's knife. How would I be treating dad's legacy if I just started randomly flinging store-bought knives at people? Wilbur sighed. Look, you know I support you when you act out your uncontrollable impulses, but we're supposed to be social distancing. It's not fair to me if you come home without having taken the proper precautions. I mean, if you want to quarantine yourself in the bedroom for three weeks after every kill. You're really being a jerk, said Hank. It's bad enough that the media is focusing way more on the global pandemic than my regional killing spree. Hardly anybody's even talking about the Soupville stabber anymore. How do you think that makes me feel, huh? I'll tell you how. It makes me feel unloved. Now my own brother is saying he wants to lock me away in the darkness of my bedroom for three weeks. That's some serious balderdash, bro. I don't care. If you're going to claim victims, you're going to do it responsibly. Hank stared at Wilbur for a long time. Finally, he shook his head. All right, you win. I'll throw knives at them and see how it works out. And no killing essential workers. What? They risked their lives enough already to keep society functioning. It would suck for them to get murdered after evading the virus all this time. Okay, said Hank. I'll stay six feet away while I slay non-essential workers. Thank you. You're doing the right thing. The end. Very Steve, nice. Appointment. I need to step out for a moment. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. You better about that? All right. Mm -hmm. I'll be back. Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I didn't actually have another reading prepared, uh, but I thought maybe you guys would, uh, we could do a little improv. Do you guys like improv? Uh, okay. Uh, I, I guess I'll take that as a yes. Okay. So, uh, I've never done any improv before, but it's kind of interactive. So I need you guys to like interact with me a little bit. Okay. So the first thing I need is the name of a location. Okay. Uh, location, location. All right. I, I'm not getting any suggestions. Okay. Uh, whatever. Fuck it. Let's say, let's say it's a Starbucks. Okay. Uh, so yeah, um, I walk into Starbucks and uh, I go to order my coffee. Then I uh, pay the cashier um, and he writes my name wrong on the cup. That's a pretty relatable thing. I guess that's happened to all of us. Uh, he writes Steven, but he writes it with a V, which is, you know, pretty common misspelling because there are also some people who spell Steven with a V. And uh, so, yeah. And scene. Okay, so for the next thing, I'm going to do sort of a Mad Libs kind of thing. So I need a profession and also a location again, but um, it can't be Starbucks again and also an object. So profession, location, object, um, uh, right? Anything will work. Any location, anything is good. Uh, okay, all right, I'll just do it myself again. Uh, because you people aren't really interested. So we're going to do a surgeon and a bank, and um, the object will be a, a waffle. So, hi, I just got done my shift at the hospital because I'm a surgeon. But what you didn't know was it was an animal hospital because I'm actually a horse surgeon. And, uh, yeah, uh, I need money because surgeons make good money. Uh, even horse surgeons, I guess. And I'm going to use the money to buy a waffle. And scene. All right. So I think that one went pretty well. Had some ups and downs, you know, but all kind of came together at the end. Kind of a tightrope improv. Uh, that's what they say. They say it's a tightrope walk. Uh, okay. So this next improv game, you build a story one word at a time. And each person says a word. And then the next person says the next word. And then you build a story like that. So here we go. I went outside and I saw a blue jay and it was eating a worm and scene. 
Yeah, that one was kind of a high wire trapeze artist kind of thing. Improv, you know, it's it's working without a net. So now that the audience is a little bit warmed up, uh, next thing we're going to do is discuss the rules of improv. So rule number one is always say yes and never no but. Uh, and rule number two is there there are no rules. Uh, rule number three, I guess, is uh, there may be no rules, but also observe rule one, the, the one about always saying yes and. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is where, you know, you start a scene and then you pause the scene and step in and take it in a completely different direction. So I need a, a profession and a location and an object again. Uh, okay, anything will work. So any profession is good. So just don't be afraid. Just shout it out. Uh, all right, so fuck it. We're just going to go with the bank, the horse surgeon, and the waffle again. Uh, oh, but you didn't know I was a horse surgeon, so just forget that I said that. Just just a surgeon. Okay. <clears throat> hey, I'm a horse surgeon, and uh, oh, I mean, I'm just a surgeon, and I just got off my shift at the hospital. Freeze. Okay, now I'm a surgeon, but I'm uh, an apple surgeon. You know, one of those guys that, like, uh, cuts the trimmings from a tree to keep the orchards healthy. You know, I'm one of those surgeons now. So I'm, uh, I'm cutting the tree branches to keep the orchard healthy like I do every day. Freeze. Okay, I'm, uh, the joke now is that I'm a horse, but I'm a surgeon. So I'm like physically the animal that is a horse, but I'm a regular surgeon. So like I operate on people, I guess, except I, I don't know what a horse learned human anatomy. I don't know if that makes sense even in the context of the game, but um. Oh, hey, so I walk into a bar and the bartender says, why the long face? Because I'm a horse, so I have like literally a long face, but also because that's what you do sometimes when people look a little depressed. And scene. Okay, so that was an afternoon at the Improv with Stephen Kosniewski. And if you liked it, you can buy my merch. And I guess by merch, I mean my books, because books are kind of like improv. They're both like high stakes lion taming kind of level. So, all right, that's that's the end. Hey, sorry I had to step out. I assume that went great. I think so. I, I think everybody really enjoyed it. All right, I assume. I just figured, you know, I I apologize for having to, to step out during your event. I'm sure I would have provided no assistance anyway, so. Yeah, no, it's it's fine. The audience was great. The troop okay, was great. great. I'm glad you carried the weight for us. So, all right. My next story is called Scares That Scare. And this will be appearing in the Scares That Care charity anthology to be published sometime a few months from now. I've got a fantastic idea, Brian told Mr. Ripple. Mr. Ripple sighed, but resisted the urge to let out a soft groan. All right, let's hear it. Your convention is called Scares That Care, right? Yes. What if we change the name to Scares That Scare? Excuse me? Hear me out. When I hear about a convention called Scares That Care, my first thought is, well, how scary can that really be? I mean, if there's a spirit of caring involved, that's not so frightening, is it? But Scares That Scare? Holy cow. I'd be trembling before I even walk through the door. I'm very busy right now, said Mr. Ripple. So if you could just wait, wait, said Brian, before Mr. Ripple could finish saying fuck off. Don't dismiss my idea so quickly. People are lazy. They use acronyms. STS is a better acronym than STC. STC makes me think of Salt Lake City and its strict labor laws, strict alcohol laws. Salt Lake City is SLC, not STC. Yes, yes, I know. But STC is closer to SLC than STS is. I'll admit that it's possible that I'm the only one having this issue, but what if I'm not? You could be losing out on dozens of registrations every year because of the connection in people's minds. How did you even get in the house, Mr. Ripple asked. Look, if you're truly married to the care idea, how about we call it scares that care about scaring? That's way scarier than scares that care. Mr. Ripple let out a soft groan. I just don't get the whole care component, said Brian. Makes me think of the Care Bears. 
Yeah, sure. The Care Bears haunt my dreams sometimes, singing those creepy melodies, their skin, those unnatural pastel colors. But still, if you're trying to run a horror convention, what's with all the caring? The convention is for the scares that care charity. You understand that, right? The what now? The charity. We raise money for families coping with incredible hardships like childhood illness, breast cancer, and severe burns. Oh, I'll be honest, I was mostly just interested in the Sons of Anarchy guys. Look, it's a horror convention for a good cause. That's the meaning of the name. Now, are you going to leave or am I going to push the button that opens the trap door to drop you into the alligator pit? Mr. Ripple was not bluffing. The alligator pit had come with the house, complete with live gators, and after some initial qualms, he'd grown to enjoy having it underneath his living room floor. Mr. Ripple was one of the kindest and most generous people in the horror genre, but he'd drop your ass into the alligator pit if you got on his last nerve. All right, I'll go, said Brian. Now that I've had time to think about it, the whole Salt Lake City thing doesn't make much sense. Two of the three letters are the same, but you can say that about a lot of acronyms. Sorry I broke the kitchen window to get inside. As Brian walked toward the front door, Mr. Ripple thought about what he'd said. Scares the Care was a silly, redundant name. Scares that Scare was a silly, redundant name for a convention, and only a complete freaking douchebag would use it. But was Scares that Care about scaring such a bad idea? If it took longer to say, people would spend more time thinking about the convention, and that meant more money for the charity. He'd do it. That would be the new name effective immediately. But he couldn't let Brian take the credit. Hold on, come back, said Mr. Ripple. Brian happily bounced back to the center of the living room, and Mr. Ripple pressed the button. A look of sorrow and betrayal appeared on Brian's face as the trap door opened and he plunged into the pit with 29 ravenous alligators. His screams of agony didn't last long. The alligators hadn't fed in several days, and they made a quick meal of him. Mr. Ripple pressed the button to reset the trap door and then added design new t-shirts to his to-do list. The end. Oh, 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 we're, we're over. <laughs> did you have fun writing that story, Jeff? I most certainly did. Most certainly did. You always have fun killing me. All right. Um, you guys got a little less than 10 minutes left. I thought we would take some questions. Uh, if anybody has questions for Jeff or Steven, type them in. I did see one here for you, Jeff, and I'm scrolling back up through. The problem is there are so many. Qu here it is right here. Um, should have popped up on the screen. Your conversation style is spot on. Does that come naturally for you or did it take a lot of work? It took a lot of work. It, a, there's a lot of like fine tuning. So probably 80% of it is natural at this point. And then the small changes are what sells it in the end. So it, it's made to look easy, but there's a lot of detail work. Okay. Uh, Brian Smith, another member of the Scares the Care Board of Directors with a critique, surprisingly accurate portrayal of our board meetings. I can vouch for that. Um, so you mentioned the Scares the Care anthology. I don't think we've talked about that publicly yet, but maybe we can give folks a little teaser. Um, no, it's okay. I, you know, I figured you'd bring it up. Yeah, we're going to do... Uh, uh, anthology of short stories uh, by different horror authors. 100% of the proceeds will, of course, benefit the charity. Um, we put that on a back burner so that we could we could get this virtual event together first. Uh, but that will be coming here in a couple months. All right. While you guys were reading, um, let's take a look at our donations. We are currently at one thousand eight hundred and fifteen dollars. Our goal for today, our initial goal is $10,000. A reminder to folks, 100% of the money we raise today will go to our 2020 recipients. We have no overhead with this virtual convention. There's no hotel rental. Uh, you know, There's no travel costs. So 100% of your donations today are going to go to Ashley and her daughter, Natalia, who has Marfan syndrome. They're going to go to Laura, who is our breast cancer warrior. And they're going to go to Trisha, who suffered second and third degree burns to the entire right side of her body. There are two ways that you folks can donate. If you have a phone, 
All you have to do is text V care to 91999. That's V as in vampire care to 91999. Or if you prefer to use your computer, Go to scaresthecareweekend.com and click donate. Some of you are watching this on my YouTube page right now. Some of you are watching this at scaresthecareweekend.com. Um, so it's very easy for you. There's no extra step. The donate button is right there where you're watching it. We would really appreciate it. Um, like Joe said at the start of today's event, um, we understand folks are hurting right now. Um, if you can't donate, that's okay. Uh, you know, we still appreciate you. We appreciate you tuning in and supporting folks like Jeff and Stephen who have given their time uh, today free of charge. We appreciate you telling your friends and family about today's event and about the charity and maybe encouraging them to contribute as well. Um, see if we got anything else here for you guys. Um, Big Strand fan here. Mr. Strand, what's your favorite Brian Keene novel? That's a great question, Lionel. Thank you for that. I feel like I should pick something really obscure, but I have to go with The Rising. So, oh. <laughs> Hold it up again, Stephen. That's a, that's a different version of Jeff Strand's pressure. I don't think I've seen that one before. The joke. Okay. okay. Because. Yep. Where Where did you get that shirt, uh, Rose O'Keefe? Um, yeah. So Sisters of Slaughter shirt. I think I got it off of their website. Uh, if you look up the Sisters of Slaughter, or it might be Red Bubble. I'm sure it's Red Bubble or, or something like that. Um, but yeah, if you look up uh, Melissa Laysan and uh, uh, Michelle, Gar Michelle Garza and Melissa Laysan, the Sisters of Slaughter, and uh, you can get your very own shirt. Look just like Kazanuski at your next convention. Or you can get this this cool Sisters of Slaughter patch, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got one of those, too. Yeah, look at that. We match. Okay. Uh, Christy Duke says, Here we go. Square. Alex Norcross, will you be creating a collection of your humorous stories in the future, Kazanuski? Um, I think no, because I actually create these. Um, you've probably all heard me read a few of them in a row, like when we when we do with uh, like we just did today with Jeff, kind of a you know back and forth kind of thing. So you may have heard me repeat a few, but I actually write these um, specifically for conventions and sometimes for specific conventions. So it's usually it's tailored to the audience. Um, in case you couldn't tell, that improv thing was not actually an improv thing. I kind of tailored that for a um, non-existent audience as opposed to last year um the bizarro power hour thing i had tailored that to the bizarro audience so the answer is probably no the, these are bespoke things that um i mean some of them will be recorded but you're really only I, i'm really interested in the um physical interactions with your audience and and trying to give them a good time rather than saying oh i'm gonna read you chapter seven from the perfectly fine house i, I mean i, I don't I know people do that, but I, I usually find it kind of dull. Okay, probably last question for both of you from Tim Collins. Uh, what are your biggest inspiration when you are writing? The need to pay bills. Uh, Jonathan Mayberry and Joe Hill. Oh, we're supposed to pick authors. I will say Dave Barry and Richard Lehman. Those are, those are good choices. That's I can see that. And, and also what Jeff said, the need to pay bills. All right. Well, Jeff Strand, Stephen Kalasinowski, thank you both uh, for donating. Thank you for having us. Give generously. Tip your scares the care. Yes, right. please make sure to donate. Right. Anything you can. Folks who are fans of either of you, now is the time to, to donate in your name, correct? That's right. Well, hey, we made $1,000 in what, half an hour? Half an hour. Almost $1,000 in half an the, hour. The bar is set, Jans. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Uh, let me bring in our next guest here, and uh, we, will, we will kick you guys out of the stream.